Uh, our next speaker is Lonnie Thompson, who's a professor of Earth Sciences at The Ohio State University. And the title of his talk is Earth's Climate History from Glaciers and Ice Cores. Thank you very much, Michael. It's uh, my pleasure to be able to speak to you uh, this afternoon. I want to talk about what's happening to glaciers around the world and what we can tell from the ice core records of uh, the rate at which this change is taking place. Uh, we work uh, at very high elevations uh, in mountain regions around the world. And uh, this is one of our drill sites, Waskaran. Uh, is the highest tropical mountain on the planet, but it has a very long history of the climate in that part of the world. Uh, I want to uh, technician here. For some reason, we don't advance. I want to point out it's a team effort, and these are our, our team at Ohio State, uh, graduate students and postdocs, uh, as well as the funding agents that make this work uh, possible. So I want to talk uh, about glaciers as recorders of global climate change. And we're going to give an example of how climate change in the past has impacted cultures in the Andes in Peru. I want to talk about glaciers as indicators of climate change evidence for a recent acceleration in the rate at which these glaciers are being lost, and evidence that some of these glaciers are now smaller than they have been in over 6,000 years. Uh, and I, I want to just point to what I, I consider to be uh, our greatest challenges uh, in the 21st century. First of all, if you go in the hall of the National Academy of Sciences, you'll see this curve of CO2. And we're now at 393 parts per million by volume. And this continues to uh, arise each year. We have in the ice cores a very long history of how CO2 and methane and many other gases have varied. This record now goes back over 800,000 years. Uh, and you can see that there is a, a cycle uh, in these gases. This is Milankovitch forcing, a 100,000 year cycle. And CO2 rises to 300 parts per million by volume during warm periods. And it drops to about 180, 200 parts per million by volume uh, during cold periods when we have uh, lots of glaciers on the planet. Uh, currently, uh, we are at a an no analog situation when we look at the levels of CO2 uh, in the atmosphere. And we're very concerned about where the projections are of where we'll be in less than 100 years. We talk more about uh, CO2 rather than methane. Methane has a relatively short lifespan of, uh, of the order of a decade, whereas CO2 can remain in the atmosphere for decades to millennia. And if you look at, even if we were able to get a handle on this issue and stop production tomorrow, uh, CO2 would be around for a very long time impacting the climate of this planet. So here's a, a projection. If you're out uh, 100 years, you'd still have 33% of that CO2. If you're out 1,000 years, you still have about 20%. Uh, of course, part of the drivers here is our population, and that has increased. And it's kind of hard to get a, a handle on these numbers, but we'll have uh, 219,000 more people at supper tonight than we had last night on this planet. So these are huge impacts. And we often don't look at... Uh, what it requires uh, to feed those people. And here's just a, an indication of uh, how much uh, is needed. And if you look at back in the natural system, if you look here in the U.S., uh, in the pre-exploitation time, there were only 60 to 80 million bison uh, in the Great Plains. So these are, these are huge impacts. And if you look at energy, uh, certainly we can see that consumption, if you look uh, from space at the Earth today, but it's amazing if you look at what the projections are in the next few decades. This is from General Electric of what the world would look like. And, and of course, the question is, where is that energy coming from? 
And how is it going to impact the climate on this planet? Well, we look at glaciers, and we have these very long histories out of the polar regions, but we now have histories going back over 25,000 years in the tropics. So we can start looking at how the climate system has worked as recorded uh, in ice. Uh, this photo was taken on the margin of the Kelkaya ice cap. You can see the annual layers because there's a very distinct wet and dry season. Uh, and the same place in 2002. So it kind of brings home the message that not only are we losing the glaciers, which are a very important uh, water resource for many people, but we're also losing the history that's recorded uh, in this ice. Uh, so ice records many parameters in the climate system, and I'm only going to mention two of them. Temperature as recorded in the isotopes of oxygen and hydrogen uh, in the ice, and also the net accumulation, the amount of precipitation that falls uh, through time. There are very few archives that allow us to look at that, uh, and ice does. Uh, the analysis are done in clean rooms, uh, the chemistry and the dust, uh, isotope labs. Uh, we now have over 7,000 meters of core stored at minus 30 degrees C. It's the only tropical collection on Earth. And we design and build the drills to recover uh, these cores. They have to be lightweight, portable systems. I was asked to say just a little bit of how that's done. So here's a typical drill setup at 20,000 feet. Uh, the power sources vary. Uh, we developed the first photovoltaic-driven ice core drill back in 1983. A wonderful source at 20,000 feet. Uh, they perform 20 to 30 percent above manufacturer specs. But we also have uh, redesigned diesel uh, engines to be more efficient and actually work in cold environments at 20,000 feet. Transport is a problem. We're above most uh, aircraft capabilities, and therefore we use what's available in the different parts of the world. This is a view of the Kelkaya ice cap in the Andes of Peru. It's the largest tropical ice cap on our planet. Uh, if you're working in Tibet, uh, you have to move across the Tibet plateau and then up to the, the top of the Himalayas. And getting the ice out of those areas requires a combination of using Sherpas, to get down to the edge of the ice, but when you get to the edge of the ice, you're still three or 4,000 feet above the plane where the vehicles are, so you have to use the local transport system, and in the Himalayas, that's yaks. Uh, those are insulated boxes. There are six meters of core in each box, 12 meters per yak. We drill five to 600 meters of core, so you have to have a whole herd of yaks to move that down to uh, the trucks, and then eventually air cargo out of China. So there's a lot of logistics that go in to get the records. So we have drilled uh, around the world. Uh, these are the places that we've recovered records. And uh, the tropics are a very important part of our planet. Over 50% of the surface area lies between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. The central panel here shows sea surface temperatures. Uh, and you can see that uh, if you look at the lower panel, that uh, sea surface temperatures drive precipitation in this part of the world. But if you get up to 500 uh, millibar level where the glaciers are, temperatures are very uniform in tropics, and they're all behaving in the same way. So I'm going to take you to one of these, the Kelkaya ice cap. Uh, it's 14 degrees south of the equator in the Andes of Peru. Uh, this shows the location right above the Amazon basin. It's in an area where you can see the monthly precipitation, very distinct wet and dry season. If you look down a crevasse, you can actually see every dry season, every one of those bands. And if you go down in the crevasse, you can see how uniform these bands are. So by measuring uh, the thickness of those, you can get the net balance precipitation of the past. So you drill through 168 meters and bring that core back. You analyze it. And here's just one section to show you how the isotopes show us the annual variations, as well as the dust. Measure the thickness, and you got the precipitation. Now, uh, if you uh, bring those back and you analyze them, then you can look at, in this case, we're looking at the last 1,000 years, decadal averages of isotopes, which is our temperature proxy. The reds are warm periods, the blues are colder. So you can see the cold during the Little Ice Age. You can also see the warming in the 20th century. But you can also see the reproducibility in these records. The first one was drilled in 1983. Uh, when we couldn't bring back frozen ice, we didn't have the technology, we brought back 6,000 bottled water samples. Uh, 
And 20 years later, when we brought back frozen core, you can see the reproducibility in that record. Uh, you can look at the precipitation over the last thousand years. The browns are periods of reduced precipitation, and the blues are heavier precipitation. And so you can look at the 20th century and see the warming, and you can also see that it's been wetter than average. Now, this area of the world has a, a, has a very long history of uh, human occupation, and so understanding how that climate varies through time becomes very important. If you look at the isotopes in these cores and compare them to sea surface temperatures, you can see there's a very high correlation to temperatures in the central Pacific Ocean. And if you, if you look at this annually back to, to the period for which we have sea surface temperature measurements back to uh, uh, about uh, uh, 1857, you can see how uh, correlated the isotopes in these cores and the SSTs are. So you can use the ice cores to actually uh, project those back into the past. Peru is also impacted greatly by El Niños. Uh, the, when we, this is the 97, 98 El Niño, very wet in the north, northern Peru and Ecuador, but very dry in the south where this ice cap is located. Uh, this area has this very long history of uh, pre-Spanish occupation and cultures like the Incas. And we can work with archeologists and anthropologists and actually look at how climate has impacted those cultures in the past. So I'm going to take you very quickly through the last 1,800 years. And if you look at these cultures, when it's dry up in the southern Andes where this ice cap is located, we have development of coastal cultures. And the capitals are in the coast. When it gets wetter, as you can see in the blue here, uh, the cultures move inland and the capitals move in inland. When it dries again, uh, they moved back to the coast, and the capitals moved to the coast. And when it became wet again, we had the rise of the Inca Empire, which lasted until the arrival of the Spanish in 1531. Now, if you come to the 20th century, and you look, uh, the ice core record would say people should be moving inland. But we know that since uh, about 1947, people have been migrating to the coastal deserts of Peru, to the big cities like Lima, in search for a better way of life. And now there's tremendous water shortages, and they're looking uh, to put in tunnels through the Andes to capture water that now goes into the Amazon and bring it back. Uh, but in the long history of humans, uh, you would be moving. So we can take these records, and we can mine them, and we can look at the long-term history. This is isotope records for the last 2,000 years. You can see the Little Ice Age. You can see the warming in the 20th century. We can compare that to other temperature reconstructions for our planet. Uh, and you can see the similarities in these curves. And the red curve here is our actual instrumental record. And so the real unusual period is the last 50 years in these records. So the changes are, are very abrupt. And you can see it in the ice. Uh, the upper photo shows uh, the margin of the Kelkaya in 1977. Uh, that whole area is now a lake. And uh, the bottom photo shows the margin of that lake, the backside, in 2002. And right at the base, you can see a man walking there if you look closely. The cliff is uh, 30 meters high. We found a wetland plant deposit, perfectly preserved. And uh, this plant could be identified and dated. And it shows us that this ice cap hasn't been smaller in 5,200 years. Otherwise, this plant would have decayed had it, had it been exposed. In the insert photo there, you can see the plant, you can see where the ice wall is in 2002. Three years later, in 2005, you can see uh, the plant is in the forefront where the ice pick is, and you can see how much the wall has retreated. We've now collected over 60 plants that have been exposed as this wall retreats. And most recently, in 2011, uh, we collected plants on the other side of this lake, which formed about 35 years ago. And those plants date 6,300 years in age. And so if you look at the, uh, the age of the plants on both sides of this, plant, uh, of this uh, lake, it, you can see that 6,000 years ago, it took 1,600 years for this glacier to advance to capture those, uh, those plants uh, in the forefront. But it only took 35 years uh, to retreat in recent times to re-expose those plants. So they're changing very abruptly. 
We can look at the longer records coming from uh, glaciers like Waskaran to the north, look at the isotope record, look at the present, and project that back in time. And if you do so, you can see those, you come to a place where temperatures were similar to today, and that's when these plants were growing around this ice cap. The real difference is how rapid the recent changes have been. Uh, nature's probably nature's best thermometer, perhaps its most sensitive and unambiguous indicator of climate change is ice. And I like this uh, quote from Henry Pollack, a world without ice. Ice asks no questions, presents no arguments, reads no newspapers, listens to no debates. It is not burdened with any ideology and it carries no political baggage. As it changes from a solid to a liquid, it just melts. So if you go around the world and you look at what's happening to the glaciers, up in Alaska, if you're up in the Brooks Range, 100% of the glaciers are retreating in the day's world. In the southeast Alaska, where the Muir Glacier is located, 98% of the glaciers are retreating. If you go to the Himalayas, it's very hard to find old photos, but here's one of a glacier taken back in 1921 and what it looked like in 2009. And when you look at these pictures, ice is just water on land. When it melts, it goes in the world's oceans and contributes to sea level rise. Uh, over in the Alps, a uh, photo from 1903, uh, a recent photo in 2005, 99% of the glaciers are retreating uh, in the Alps. If you go to the tropics uh, and you look at uh, what's happening ice in that part of the world, this uh, margin of the Kelkaya ice cap, the largest outlet glacier is Corey Kalis, uh, photo in 1978, and a photo taken in 2009. This lake actually started forming in 1991, now covers 84 acres, so over 60 meters deep. 100% of the glaciers in the tropics are retreating in today's world. If you go to the Himalayas, a very important uh, part of the world, it covers over 5 million square kilometers, one of the largest glacier stores of fresh water, some 46,000 glaciers, most of them haven't been studied. Uh, and if you look at the source of the major rivers, in that part of the world, the Indus, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, they source up in the Himalayas. And uh, therefore, what happens to those glaciers will have an impact on people, and particularly during the dry season. I'm going to take you very quickly to one of these, Nanunami, which is the headwater of the Indus and the Ganges and the Brahmaputra River. Uh, this is what the mountain looks like, and if you make your way up this mountain to the summit, you'll find a very large ice field. And uh, we drilled three cores to bedrock here, and you can see that they're uh, up to 158 meters deep. And the first thing you do when you bring the cores back is you look for radioactive bomb horizons. All the thermonuclear tests we've done in the atmosphere have left a radiation level. So the first one we look for is the 62-63 Soviet test, and you can see in all the previous cores drilled in that part of the world, it's there. But you don't see it on Nanunami. Then we look for uh, the Ivy test from 1952 to 1958, further back in time. We find that in chlorine 36 preserved in ice around the world. But you don't find it on Nanunami. You don't find it because that glacier is melting from the top down. It's no longer accumulating in today's world. And so this has tremendous implications for water resources on that area. Working with the Institute of Tibetan Plateau uh, in Beijing, China, we have uh, looked at 7,090 of those 46,000 glaciers uh, from satellite images from 1970 to the present. And this actually shows the percent of ice loss per year. So the bigger the dot, the greater the loss of ice. And you can see it's not uniform across the plateau. The, we're losing more ice in the south along the Himalayas than in other parts of that region. You go to Africa, to Kilimanjaro, uh, the oldest photo is shown up in 1912, and you can see what it looked like in 2006 at the bottom there. Uh, the first map was made in 1912, and uh, we've continued to map the loss of ice in that part of the world. So we've lost about 85% of the ice on the mountains since 1912, 26% since the year 2000 when we drilled there. So the loss of ice is accelerating. And again, we put uh, uh, ablation stakes on these glaciers. And you can see when it was put out in 2000, and another view of the same stake in 2004. These glaciers are no longer accumulating. They're wasting from the top down. And so that has, again, tremendous implications on 
water resources. So if you look at the glaciers on uh, Kilimanjaro and you look at the, the volume of water or ice loss and you look at what percentage is coming from shrinking, the aerial changes, and that's what you see when you observe glaciers from satellites, and the percentage coming from thinning, which is the changes uh, in thickness, then you can see that they're about equal. So we miss that when we look at satellite images. Uh, here's a view of the crater on Kilimanjaro, uh, the Fjordwanger Glacier in the foreground in 1999, the same place about six months ago. So you can see how rapidly these glaciers are thinning and also breaking up. So uh, those glaciers will disappear in the near future. The last place I want to look at is over in uh, Papua, Indonesia. Uh, this is the only glacier that exists between the Himalayas and the Andes in South America. If you look at the photos uh, in this area, the oldest photo we found is 1936. And you come forward in time, you can see how the ice is being lost. Uh, these are uh, Landsat 5 images, the upper one in 1989. The blue areas are glaciers. Many of those glaciers had disappeared by 2009. Uh, this is the only glacier we have ever drilled where it rained every day uh, while we were at the drill site. And you can see in the, uh, in, in the lower photo that uh, that's where a tent set for two weeks. In two weeks, the surface lowered 30 centimeters. If that's any indication at the rate that the ice is being lost, that comes out to more than seven meters of thickness per year. And we drilled three cores, two to bedrock. It's only 32 meters thick. So if you do the calculations, these glaciers are going to be gone in a matter of years. And the history that's recorded uh, in the ice. Uh, here we compare the loss of ice on Kilimanjaro, the red squares, with that on the, uh, the New Guinea glaciers. And you can see they're very similar. And if you project those in, uh, into the future, you can see the glaciers are going to be gone in the next few years at these sites. So there are tremendous uh, implications for people who live uh, in those areas. Um, if you look at what might be driving that, if you look at the uh, um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change projections uh, uh, with an 800 part per million increase in CO2, you can see that there's a vertical amplification in the low latitudes. And you can see the elevation of these drill sites. And they are very sensitive to these changes, and we believe these glaciers are already responding uh, to those uh, changes. So if you were to look at the Earth uh, as a whole, uh, where we have glaciers and where we have observations of ice, uh, the, the ice is disappearing very rapidly. Uh, sea level is rising currently at about 3.3 millimeters uh, per year, but that's projected to increase as we go forward in time. So climatologically, we are in unfamiliar territory, uh, and the world's ice cover is responding very dramatically to uh, these changes. So if uh, you were to look at uh, what are our greatest challenges in the 21st century, I would say that uh, it's uh, learning how to get along with each other. This is, a, this is an issue that's been with us for uh, a very long time, and you can debate uh, how well we're doing that. Uh, but the other is learning how to get along with the planet that we live on. Uh, where is that power going to come from? Uh, certainly the consumption on the planet is growing much faster than the population, and it takes energy to do that. And so I think this, this whole question uh, is, is key. Uh, it's very key to what the climate will be uh, as we look forward in the future. Uh, these two challenges uh, deal with human behavior. And, uh, and, and they are therefore very closely related. And so I, I think that uh, when we talk about solutions or how do we, uh, we really need to have a better understanding about people and how, to, uh, how we react and how, we, how do we change. So I want to uh, close with this photograph of, uh, of the Earth. We saw this earlier. Uh, and certainly, if you were to uh, look at the planet uh, from space, uh, and as uh, Dr. Chu was saying, it's, it's a unique place. Uh, we know that. Uh, and if we talk about uh, global climate change, uh, if uh, it's for sure that nature is the timekeeper 
on this change. And unfortunately, none of us are, can see the clock that we're working with. And, but we, we have a good idea that it's ticking. And so uh, I think these are extremely important issues. And I think this is a tremendous session to have uh, here uh, at uh, APS. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand down here so I can see people. And okay. then I'll... So we have time for a couple of questions. And I'm going to stand down here so I can actually see your hands this time. Over there. And if you can make your way to a microphone, that would be very helpful. Yeah, I sort of saw Hi. some of the. Oh. I, I saw some of this in your uh, graph. But maybe you could say a few words on where are we now versus the you know, 100,000 ice age cycles and what kind of temperature range that was versus what we've seen so far in human-made. Well, if you, if you look at the uh, normal glacial, interglacial cycle, uh, this is determined by uh, Milankovitch uh, forcings and they include uh, eccentricity, this 100,000 year cycle which has to do with the fact that our orbit is not a circle but an ellipse around the sun. Uh, it's also driven by the fact that we are tilted on our axis, and that tilt changes from uh, uh, 22.4 uh, degrees up to 24.5 degrees, and we're currently at about 23.5 degrees. And we also have the fact that we're wobbling on that axis, and that creates a 22,000 year uh, precession cycle. And so those kind of combine to cause the changes that we see in our climate. If you look at that combination, you really act, uh, actually have to go back to isotope stage 11, which is uh, about uh, 415,000 uh, years ago to find an interglacial very similar to the one we're in now. Uh, that interglacial lasted 30,000 years. And ours is different because uh, we're outside of that natural forcing. On top of that, we now have the human component. And so a lot of people uh, look at this interglacial uh, will actually be a super interglacial uh, when we look at the long-term history. Uh, we have a Hello. question over here. Uh, yes. Uh, there are, from the talks I've seen today so far, and also from uh, what I've been reading over the past eight years or so, there are a number of uh, processes involved that one has to take into account regarding climate change, such as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which was in its cool phase when uh, people were worried about global cooling from the around 40s to the 70s. Uh, I think the, the best thing that one can have, just general, uh, is for the American Physical Society to promote a, uh, an interchange between uh, people who have the different opinions on uh, climate change. So when I was the chair of the New England section of the American Physical Society, uh, we had a session where we had people from both sides of the uh, issues, whether humans are causing climate change or whether they're not. Um, it's a problem, I think, um, and uh, what one needs is uh, more, of a, more of an interchange. And uh, what's happened is that the, uh, the American Physical Society has come out with an incontrovertibility stand about climate change. And uh, this has been uh, resulting in a number of people who have resigned uh, and who have challenged the, the APS. So uh, in, in, one, in particular, one of the groups to, uh, on climate physics, uh, one of the organizers of the group uh, just resigned. And um, I can pass out something which give people an idea of uh, what the problem is. So what I'm appealing to is I'm appealing to the APS to have a more balanced presentation of uh, what's going on with the issue of climate. I'm not saying that glaciers so I, aren't melting I, in part because of that. So I'll, I will just pass out uh, something, and if you can read it if you like. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. So you don't need to respond to that question. I'll respond and just say that what the APS has decided to do by forming this topical group on the physics of climate 
is to concentrate on ways that physicists can contribute to our understanding of climate and climate change. And so uh, I would like, we have time for one last question, assuming that it's a question for the speaker and not a statement. So do you have a question for the speaker? I have a, I have a question for the speaker. Okay, please ask the you, speaker you, a question. Uh, this is out of my own ignorance. You said that uh, methane has a lifetime of something like 10 years in the atmosphere. What's, what's causing it to decay? It's converted to CO2. Uh, it's uh, pulled out by precipitation on the Earth, uh, converted to CO2. Uh, so it doesn't have this uh, the long uh, uh, resonance time that we find with carbon dioxide. Is it photo? Is the sun causing it? Or is it just somehow the general uh, the it's way a, the atmosphere moves around? Uh, it, it's, it's a process of... Uh, Precipitation, uh, a lot of different processes uh, uh, on the uh, on the Earth, and the conversion uh, uh, to uh, to CO two by by those processes. So the implication is we have less to worry about with, with unless we have massive uh, uh, methane leaks, or uh, we really have to worry about CO two. Well, CO2, uh, methane has a, 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 a huge impact as a greenhouse gas. It's just that its resonance time and its impact. Uh, on the system will be uh, uh, not as long-lived as, as what we find with CO2. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, one very quick, and I assume it's a question, right? It's a, it's a question. Good. <clears throat> you mentioned that uh, CO2 has a decay time of hundreds to thousands of years. Um, so a couple of things. First is the present level of CO2 and what's happening with glaciers melting. Do you consider this dangerous? Um, and if we were to, uh, you know, even stop at this level, which we're, we're not going to be able to probably, but um, what would we, what can we do about it if it's going to last for hundreds of years? Well, I, I think these are, these are uh, issues that uh, certainly uh, we need uh, we need to uh, think deeply about. But the fact is, in the climate system, there is a twenty to thirty year response time. It takes before we see the full impact of what we've already done to the atmosphere, it's going to take that, that long. So this is not something that you change quickly. And so if you were to look at the future, I would say that we are really looking, we've come to, there was a time when we talked about preventing climate change, but I think we're, we're, uh, where we are, can mitigate climate change, we can look at uh, uh, ways to capture CO2, sequester CO2, reduce the emissions of CO2 by looking at different energy sources. Uh, we can talk about geoengineering, uh, ways that uh, you, you might uh, be able to come up with ways to counter what, uh, what we see happening. But that, of course, is very dangerous. Uh, we have to look at adaptation, uh, because we're going to have to adapt uh, to what we, is already uh, underway. And this may impact uh, yeah. Our agricultural practices, uh, uh, where people choose to build, uh, we, we saw the, uh, the losses uh, insurance companies are facing. Insurance companies are already seeing uh, the impacts of these natural disasters in the climate system. So, uh, and, and the way companies work, of course, is they move out of those areas where uh, the risks are, are too high because companies are in the business of making money, but that leaves taxpayers and, and other people to pick up those uh, pick up those costs and I think if we what we don't do with mitigation and adaptation will lead to suffering and many of the places where I work uh, the people who live in those areas are already being impacted by the loss of water resources uh, as these glaciers disappear thank you very much uh, Lonnie for sharing with us uh, your beautiful data on uh, glaciers and ice cores thank you